You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Hello and welcome. My name is Kate Linett with the Federal Judicial Center and we bring you this program today in collaboration with the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services at the Administrative Office. Over the next hour we're going to be talking about the Texas Christian University Drug Screen Instrument. It was created at the Institute of Behavioral Research at Texas Christian University. And with me today to talk about this is the principal investigator from that project, Dr. Kevin Knight who is from IBR at TCU. And he will be talking about the fundamental research that underlies this whole project and this screening instrument. We also have Derek Goddard, who, as you all know, is a probation and pretrial services administrator with the Office of Probation and Pretrial Services at the AO. And he's going to talk about the policy implications of the TCU. And for those people who are wondering about how you're going to implement this in your district, we have two people here to talk about that also, two treatment specialists. The first is Mike Laughlin, who is from the Northern District of Texas. And we also have with us Grace Saunders, who is from the District of the District of Columbia. And both of them will be talking about different implementation issues and how to get this started in your district. So while this really essentially is a program about a form, stay with us because we really have a lot of important stuff to tell you about the research, the policy, and the implementation issues with this. We will assume that you've downloaded a copy of the TCU, which is included in your program materials available on our DCN, so that you can refer to it during the program. That will make it much easier for all of you. I'm going to turn the program over first to Dr. Knight. He, is, um, at, at, he has his doctorate in experimental psychology. He has been at the Texas Christian University since 1991. And as I said before, he's really the principal investigator on this project, so certainly the person to talk about the research that's behind the form for us. His primary focus in all the research he's done has been on working with substance abusers both in correctional and community correction settings using evidence-based practices. He's worked and advised and been an advisor to probably every federal agency out there who has anything to do with treating substance abusers. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Knight to talk about, first of all, the underlying research. Dr. Knight? Thank you, Kate. I am part of a team at the Institute of Behavioral Research, which is directed by Dwayne Simpson, that has been working on the TC drug screen now for a number of years in terms of revising it for correctional settings and in terms of testing its effectiveness within those settings. But before I get into the nuts and bolts of the instrument itself, I want to start with a little bit of background research information and the rationale as to why you might consider using the instrument in your setting. First, in terms of rationale, since the early 70s, there's been a prevailing sentiment within the criminal justice system that nothing works that treatment essentially is a waste of money and for the most part ineffective. And to many res to, in many respects that is true when referral to treatment is inappropriate or when the treatment services that are being provided aren't well matched to the needs of the offender. However, we have a number of studies in the past decade that support the notion of treatment effectiveness when good treatment is provided appropriately to those offenders in need of treatment. And so let's begin by looking at a slide from a study conducted in Texas in 1999, published in 1999 in the Prison Journal, where we looked at a number of offenders who had fairly severe problems with drug use. Those in the far left on the bottom were ones eligible for treatment but did not receive treatment, primarily because they did not have enough time left to serve in their sentence. The middle group represents those who completed the in-prison therapeutic community treatment program, but did not complete the community-based aftercare program. 
And on the bottom right is the group that completed the fully prescribed in prison and aftercare community based treatment components. When we look at return to custody rates over the three years after release, we see at the end of the first year that those who completed the prescribed program on the far right in the orange did much better than the other two groups. This continued into the second year and into the third year, where at the end of three years, you see on the far right, 26% of the aftercare completers were returned to custody. This compares with those on the far left who did not receive any sort of intervention, 52% returning to custody within three years. And the middle group, two out of three were back in custody, uh, in large part because one of the conditions of their release was their participation in the aftercare program. So failing to participate did result in reincarceration. The key to these types of successful outcomes, however, is important to understand that the key is on successful, appropriate treatment referral, identifying those in need, in treatment, in need of treatment and not placing those with less severe problems into these more intensive programs. At this point, what I'd like to do is point out that um, when we look at the impact of personal bias when subjective screening and referral takes place, we see that different views on addiction, for example, the view whether or not alcohol is considered a drug, whether or not addiction is a disease or moral failure, these types of different views result in differences in opinion on who needs treatment services. So when we think about why a drug screen is needed, why you should be using a drug screen, we understand that using an objective, validated drug screen can help you determine if an offender might benefit from receiving treatment services. No guarantee that they will, but again, a screen such as the TC drug screen can help provide an objective, consistent means for identifying who might benefit from, a drug, from an objective screen. Next, we look at, don't all offenders have a drug use problem? The reality is, in fact, most offenders do have a drug problem, but not all. If you look at a study conducted by NIJ over the past uh, 15 years or so, we see that early on, about in the red bars, 59% of offenders upon arrest were coming up dirty on a urine test. 42% in 91 coming up positive for any, uh, for cocaine use. The trends changed a little bit, but not much to 1999, where we see, again, about two-thirds coming up with any positive drug use urine test, and 35%. These are only based on folks who volunteer to participate in the study, so we know the rates are higher. But again, the point here is that not all offenders have drug use at the time of arrest, and not all drug offenders need drug treatment. So that takes us into the development of the TCU drug screen, and the fact that it is a very brief, short assessment. It's only two pages in length. It is based on the diagnostic and statistical manual classification criteria for dependents. It has another section which asks items about treatment needs, motivation, the history of treatment, and perhaps one of the most important aspects besides its validation and reliability is that it's a free instrument for you to use and when necessary can be self-administered. Currently, the TCU drug screen is being administered in several locations across the United States, including both state and federal systems. Its popularity continues to go forward, and we're very excited about this initiative within the pretrial and probation services. Prior research with this instrument that we have conducted, as well as a group out of the University of South Florida, have found that the instrument is highly accurate overall. There's an 82% agreement rate. That is, 82% of those who have a problem are identified as having a problem, as well as those who do not have a problem identified as not having a problem. That leads to this notion of inappropriate referrals, in that in this case, the TCU drug screen is particularly effective at 
finding out those who do not need treatment and avoiding inappropriate referrals. And finally, the TCU drug screen is relatively good at identifying those who really have drug problems. An important component, obviously, of any screen is de correctly detecting those who have drug problems. When the drug screen was compared with the ASI drug use section, CSATS, simple screening inventory, the SASE, as, a as well as a variety of other screening instruments, the TC drug screen was one of the top three performers among these self-reported drug screen instruments when compared with the structured clinical instru diagnostic instrument that looks at DSM criteria, the SCID. 83% overall correct classification for the drug screen, 84% for the ASI and 84% for the SSI. I know many of you already use the SASE and I want to point out at this juncture that 70% were correctly classified with the SASE, far lower than the other three instruments presented here. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Kate. Thanks, Dr. Knight. Um, we're going to go back to Dr. Knight in a couple minutes to actually go through the form itself and through each question. But for right now, I want to turn this over to Derek Goddard from the AO and have a little chat with him because we're talking about the TCU um, this has been one of your favorite projects for the last, um, I don't know, year or so. Yeah. And I know you have a lot of different responsibilities at OPS, but let's just focus in on this. One of the things we know is that you are the chair of the National Expert Panel. And can you talk to me a little bit about the National Expert Panel, where it came from? Yes, Kate. Uh, about a year ago, uh, we put together a, a group of um, probation and pretrial services personnel, uh, deputy chiefs, supervisors, specialists, and uh, officers. And what we wanted to do is to provide a communication bridge with the field and the administrative office. One of the things we wanted to do was to formalize that process, so we selected a representative from each uh, judicial circuit. And what they're doing is basically being a two-way communication um, a bridge for us they're basically pretty much providing uh, input and feedback from districts within their circuit and then they're, uh, we're providing information to them about some of our national initiatives. Uh, they have helped us on several national initiatives so far. Uh, the cost containment initiatives, you know, with the tough budget times that we have. And they also have now helped us with pilot testing this TCU drug screening instrument. Um, that was very, very helpful to us and we have a, a group of folks uh, that are very talented throughout the system and we have two of them here that you will talk to later about the TCU drug screen. Okay, so why introduce this now? Why? One of the things that we're trying to do here is we're trying to come up with a uniform screening process in the case planning cycle. Uh, right now there's a lot of subjective ways that people are uh, looking at uh, substance abuse cases and making that determination. As a system, we want to be able to be at a place where we can unify, you know, in a unified way, have uh, an instrument that kind of determines a substance abuse, not only presence, but the severity. And I think that's what we're looking for. And hopefully, as we become more of an outcome-based agency, this will help us in having a baseline or a foundation knowing, you know, what type of substance abuse cases that we have. Okay, so let's be real clear on this. This is not policy yet? No, Kate, it's not policy at this time. Uh, what we're trying to do now is uh, just set the stage. We know that this is something that has been validated. It's a very solid instrument. And what we're trying to do is get people to not only pilot test it, but use it in, in, in their district. Um, in December of 2004, we're going to uh, ask the Criminal Law Committee to look at the TCU, they've already been aware of it, but also to endorse it as the TCU drug screen for the probation and pretrial services system. Okay, great. Now, you talked about the communication back and forth. That's one of the reasons for having the National Expert Panel, and they've really helped you out on this project. Um, they've done the pilot testing. We're going to go back to them to talk a little bit about it. We know it's not policy right now. We know it's going to be taken to the Criminal Law Committee. We'll see what happens with that. And the other thing you touched on were the tough budget times. And so one of the real um, joys to this particular screen is that 
first of all, it's free. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a free, <laughs> validated instrument. Yeah. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, it's already been paid for through the research funds, the federal funds. Um, we think that also that this TCU drug screen hopefully will save us money because you will be able to begin to start uh, identifying those folks that do not need treatment at all. And then also be able to identify those folks that may need further assessment or intervention or treatment. So we're hoping that you know, the introduction of this TCU drug screen into our system will help save money in these tough budget times. Okay, thanks. And we'll be saving the right money and spending the right money as we go along. Okay, we're going to get back to Derek in a couple of minutes, and he's going to talk to the um, two treatment specialists we have here who will talk about how they implemented it in their districts and what their experiences were. But we've talked about the screen. We've talked around the screen. We've talked about the purpose for introducing the screen. Let's go talk about the actual questions on the screen. So I'm going to turn this back over to Dr. Knight and let him go through each one of the questions on the screen and really tell you what's behind those questions. Dr. Knight. Thanks, Kay. Hopefully, hopefully each of you has a copy of the instrument in front of you. As I go through the instrument, please follow along. On the top of the first page, you see a set of instructions. And it's really imperative that when you sit down with the offender to do the interview, you make it emphatically clear the reason you're doing the interview and why it's imperative that the offender provide you with honest responses when you ask the questions. The rapport you establish with the offender at this point will really set the tone for whether or not they're truthful, which is obviously a big issue when you're interviewing an offender about their drug use lifestyle. So let's begin. Uh, on the very first page, you'll see on item number one, well, for all the items, the reference period that needs to be uh, looked at is the 12 months before being incarcerated. In many cases, the offenders you will be interviewing will have been incarcerated for a number of years. We're not looking at the period of incarceration. We're looking at the 12 months that they were on the street prior to incarceration at the point of which they were at risk for using substance such as alcohol and drug use. So going to the first item, during that 12 months prior to incarceration, did you use larger amounts of drug drugs or use them for a longer time, period of time than you had planned or intended. For each of the items, they need to be read verbatim and wait for a response from the offender. After that has occurred, at that point, if clarification for the items needed, go ahead and provide that. For example, if you have to indicate that the number of beers that needed to be consumed to get the same effect had to be increased, go ahead and provide that. Hopefully by the time you're administering the instrument, you've already gone through their file and have a good understanding of their prior sentences, what they've been involved with, what they've reported in their pre-sentence investigation, and you can use this information not to confront the offender that's filling this out, but to simply bring up the point that, hey, you say that you haven't had to increase use, but based on what you indicated in the pre-sentence investigation, your use escalated over time. So definitely refer back to the information you have on hand to see if, in fact, the offender would like to change their mind in their response as they gain a better understanding of the item you're asking. As we move on now to the second item, you see that it asks, did you try to cut down on your drug use but were unable to do it? I think this is fairly straightforward for those who are dependent on substances. There's always, almost always an effort to cut back, and they find that they simply can't do it. On the third item, did you spend a lot of time getting drugs, using them, or recovering from their use? Obviously, the intention of this item is to get at time diverted away from things they should be spending on to their acquisition and use of the actual drugs. Moving now on to item number four, this is a two-part item. Notice there's an A and a B section, and the stem of the question applies to both. Did you get so high or sick from drugs that it kept you from doing work, going to school, or caring for your children? That's part A. And part B asks, did it, has it caused an accident or put you or others in danger? A yes, as we'll note in a minute, to either one of these items will constitute a yes response for item number four. 
Moving on to item number five, did you spend less time at work, school, or with friends so that you could use drugs? The same notion with this item in terms of the amount of time they're dedicating toward their drug use lifestyle. And again, I'd want to repeat that all of these items are those that are also found in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is the gold standard currently for determining drug use dependence. Moving now on to item number six, a three-part question. Did your drug use cause A, emotional or psychological problems? B, problems with family, friends, work, or police? and C, physical health or medical problems. Now for most of the offender population that you'll be interviewing, they're there because they've had some run in with the police that is most likely drug related. So if they're saying no to that item, um, that's a sure bet that that needs some sort of follow up on your part to see if in fact their arrest was drug related. And if so, prompting the client to see if they need to change their response to yes on that item. Moving now on to item number seven, we see that it indicates, did you increase the amount of drug use you were taking so that you could get the same effects as before? The items seven, eight, and nine all refer to tolerance, which is a key part of drug dependence. On item eight, did you ever keep taking a drug to avoid withdrawal or keep from getting sick? And item number nine, did you get sick or have withdrawal when you quit or missed taking a drug? Again, these all referring to withdrawal aspects of drug addiction. Okay, these are the nine items on which the scoring is based. Simply summing the yes responses with items four and six collapsing across those sub items should give you a score from zero to nine, where zero indicates no responses on all items and nine meaning that you have a yes response to all nine items. As you'll find on the back page of the, uh, what you have in front of you, zero means no need for drug treatment, obviously. One and two, as will be discussed a little bit later, probably means more assessments needed. Three through nine corresponds with some sort of dependence-like problems with their drug use that definitely will require further assessments or additional assessment and possible treatment intervention. At this point, it's extremely important to note that this is simply a screen. It is just one component of the case plan in which you'll be making your treatment and referral decisions. Um, a zero score on this, along with nothing else in the records, should be a fairly good indication that no treatment's needed. Moving now on to item number 10. Obviously, you'll want to know what the substance or substances are that they're abusing, and this is where you give, gather that information. A, bubble in, the worst drug, and this is their perception, not yours. So they may be a heroin user, indicating that their worst substance use is with alcohol. B is the next most severe item, and C, the next after that. If they do not have a second or third, simply indicate none. But again, refer back to the records if there's indication of multiple drug use because this is where you'll capture the types of substances used and may have some implication for the types of treatment services that will be provided. Moving on to the next page, you'll see that item number 11 addresses the frequency of use for each of these types of substances. Again, referring back to the last 12 months prior to incarceration. Um, on item number 11, we know that there are a number of drugs that are currently in the process of being developed that we haven't captured here on A through K. It's there on item 11 that you'll indicate these other types of substances, particularly the newly synthet synthetic drugs that are being developed. Um, write those in there and provide the frequency of use for those substances on that line. Moving now on to the next item, number 12. This is where we start getting at injection drug use and motivation for treatment. Item number 12, you'll see that it says, during the 12 months, how often did you inject drugs with the needle? Obviously, an important component here is beyond public safety is public health, and that is trying to get a sense of the risk for HIV and other types of uh, communicable diseases that can be passed on through injection drug use. 
Item 13 asks, how serious do you think your drug use problems are? From not at all to extremely. Um, again, as will be addressed here in a few minutes, if they're indicating that they have drug use problems on the front page and not on this particular item that they need drug treatment, um, you're going to need to investigate further as to why they're responding that way. And finally, moving on to the next item, you see that it states, uh, how many times before now have you ever been in a drug treatment program? Being in a drug treatment before program before does not constitute need for continuing treatment. It could be that they participated in the RDAP program and simply need other types of reentry services as they reenter the community. Um, but again, this will give you a barometer of the types of treatment services they've already received, as well as the fact is whether or not they've had a drug problem that's needed to be addressed in the past. And finally, the last item on the instrument indicates how important is it for you to get drug treatment now? Um, from not at all to extremely. And again, this speaks to motivation. They may recognize that they have a problem, but just simply do not feel like they're ready for drug treatment at this point. So at this juncture, um, let's turn it back over to you, Derek. Thanks, Kevin. Before I basically go any further, I'd like to reintroduce uh, two of the members of the National Expert Panel that I talked about earlier, uh, a talented group of, of folks. Uh, I want to first uh, reintroduce uh, Grace Saunders from the District of the District of Columbia, uh, another talented contributor for the um, uh, National Expert Panel, and Mike Laughlin. Uh, he's the Fifth Circuit representative uh, in the National Expert Panel, and he's one of our go-to guys. Uh, uh, before we set up this role play, uh, Mike, I want to ask you a, a question. I know when you were pilot testing the um, TCU drug screen, uh, there was uh, a need to basically kind of set the stage before the interview process. Can okay. you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, sure. Well, basically in our, during our pilot, and this was similar experiences with some of the, of the other panel members who pilot tested this, we found that uh, when we did an interview process, rather than just self-administering it and just marking up a score in our hurry to get the case opened up, we found that they were much more open. Uh, we were able to establish uh, a relationship with them uh, better to build some trust and rapport. It basically complemented the initial interview process to where we showed that we were just more than just compliance monitors for the court, but that we were also individuals that were trying to be advocates for them and to be an agent of positive change uh, to help the partnership with them in developing jointly with us uh, strategies and interventions and, and referrals to the community resources that would allow us to help them establish outcome-based objectives for supervision and strategies in accordance with the uh, revised monograph. Uh, in that process, we also will um, help them talk about the conditions. A lot of times, you know, we, we deal with folks that are pretty come out pretty negative. They don't want to do another thing. They got to get to their job and take care of their family. But we want them to help them understand that is this is in their best interest to be able to uh, get into treatment if necessary and to be able to properly identify them. The value of this instrument we found is that it did eliminate unnecessary referrals quite a bit, save money. And so in that process we're going to, um, we also help them um, establish, um, uh, we were able to clarify questions and also to reconcile uh, any contradictions they had between their answers and the, um, uh, the information that we found in reviewing the file, which is important that we review, you review the file and talk to others that are involved in the case. So with that said, um, I want, we're going to do a role play. Uh, Grace is going to be a new releasee, and um, we're going to talk about establishing that rapport, building that trust, and helping establish ourselves as, as an advocate and change agent. Okay. Hello, Grace. Um, Hello. Um, we've, we've went over the conditions of supervision now, and um, we've talked a little bit about your, where you're going to be living yes. and your family situation, a little bit about your work. Uh, we've talked a little bit about what my role is as an officer in helping you to be successful, not just during supervision, but also beyond supervision. And um, now I want to find out a little bit more about your substance abuse history okay. so that I can get a better idea on what referrals, if any, might be needed for you in the community to help you stay clean while you're on supervision and to maintain that, that, that drug-free lifestyle that you maintained while you were in custody. Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to do a TCU drug screen instrument and okay. it's 15 questions 
page one has nine questions that are yes, no. The back page talks a little bit more about your level of drug use. This is staged during the last 12 months of free street time or um, non-custody time, which will be before you got arrested and, and remanded to custody, okay? okay. So we're going to use that as a, as a point of reference. Keep in mind that I'm trying to help you to be successful, so I want to be able to be real clear on what your status is so we can make sure we hook you up with the proper resources to be successful. Okay. Okay? So I'm going to go on to the first question here, uh, which asks, did you use, during that 12 months, larger amounts of drugs or use them for a longer period of time than you had planned or intended? No. No, you did not. Okay. All right. Um, now, let me ask you, I, I'm reviewing your file, talking with your husband during the pre-release. I noticed that there, things were a little stressful from what he was saying and that things were difficult uh, during that time. And then also I noticed that you had the, lost your job during that DUI arrest and you had a prior drug possession charge, although that was a little bit before the 12 months that was going on as well. Uh, those seem to normally indicate uh, a, what we call a loss of control of, of use. Um, well, I finished the BOP program when I was away. Okay. I gave you that certificate. Right. And when I was in pretrial, they sent me away to a program. And um, my job, at some point, they said, well, you need to go to treatment. So I, I did some treatment with them, too. And I got a real nice certificate from BOP. Oh, good. Yeah, I saw that. I remember I made that copy already. I have that in your file. And I saw that you had went through the program when I re re reviewed your prison um, institutional materials. Uh, but let me, let me uh, emphasize that substance abuse and, and substance uh, d um, dependency is a chronic illness. So it can be a problem now that you're on the street, you're in a brand new environment, a lot of stresses and pressures and old friends. So we want to focus on the questions here as they relate to that 12 months so I can get a better feel, okay? okay. So I'm going to point back to the question, which asks, though, in light of the DUI we talked about and your husband's input, right. did, did you use larger amounts of drugs or for a longer period of time than you intended or planned? Oh, I see. I understand. Um, yes, I did. Okay. So then the answer to that question would be yes. So I'm That's going to mark that as a yes. That's okay. correct. All right. Now we're going to go on to question two, which said, did you try to cut down on your drug use but were unable to do so? Well, things at home got kind of crazy. Um, my husband kept complaining and I was drinking and not taking care of the kids like I needed to. And, okay. Um, so and he wanted me to go to AA. And I went just because he was like, go to AA, and you need some help. So I did that, but you know, I still was drinking every now and then. So uh, I don't know. I, I guess so. Okay. So, so basically from what you just said, it sounds like you're saying that it, at times during that period it did get out of control, that you did, lo did lose control. So it, when it asked, did you try to cut down on your drug or alcohol use, which alcohol does relate, by the way, to this instrument all the way through, but were unable to do so, then you would say that would be a yes? <sighs> yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay. All right. So we're now, um, now that we've established um, some dialogue between her, we've, we, I've showed her, established myself as a little bit of an advocate and change agent, and I've um, got some openness and got past a little bit of the denial and minimization. Now we want to move on, and we're just going to intentionally jump on the instrument further down and go on to page two. And um, we're going to ask her about, we're going to jump to question number 13, and I'm going to ask you now, Grace, we've covered most of this. Um, tool now, an instrument, and I want to move on to the next question, which is question 13. How serious do you think your drug problems are now? Not at all. I told you I went to the BOP program and I mm -hmm. gave you that certificate. Right. I don't think you're listening to me. Okay. It's not at all. Well, let me, let me hear you. I don't have a problem. Okay. So you don't see at this point in time, it, the choices are not at all, slightly, moderately, considerably, or extremely important for you, or, or, excuse me, that your seriousness of your problems, you say not at all? Not at all. Okay. All right. I'm going to mark that as not at all. And then we're going to go ahead on and jump intentionally to question number 15 at this point. And, um, okay, we're moving on to the last question, Grace, and that is how important is it for you to get drug treatment now? <sighs> well, not at all. I told you. BLP, remember? Right. Um, Pre-trial, I went through, through treatment with them. And the whole time I was going to court, I was going through that drug program, and in my job, they had me go away to treatment. Uh, not at all. Okay, so you've had several prior treatment That's right. programs. Okay. All right, um, so I'm going to go ahead and put not at all there as well. Okay. All right. So that's the role play. And that's basically what we would do at that point, um, covering the, the, the subjects with them and walking them through the questions. Okay, very good. Um, 
Let's turn this over to Kate uh, at this point. Thanks, Derek. I'm going to do a couple of follow-up questions on the role play. Uh, between Mike and Grace, Grace was being fairly consistent from by the time Mike got her to those yes answers, page one, um, a little inconsistency in page two. What are the differences if you get somebody, I guess, consistent with page one and two and then inconsistent between one and two? Grace? One thing that really isn't uncommon, if you have an individual who's um, throughout the screening and questions one through nine, saying yes and they're agreeing um, that there was uh, difficulties with their addiction. But on page two, you realize um, that the individual <laughs> is starting to say, well, I don't have a problem. It could be real for that person, just as you saw in the role play, that they have gone through the drug treatment programs while in the institution and maybe even pretrial. Or in fact, what you may be hearing is that there's some denial to the fact that that person needs treatment at that time and actually minimizing their addiction. So what the officer, or I suggest the officer do, is uh, refer the um, offender back to what the score of the TCU actually said, what those findings were, and share with the offender what your recommendation is going to be based on those <coughs> findings. And just the opposite. If you have an offender who's cooperative throughout the screening, well, excuse me, who's denying, on the need for treatment throughout the screening and questions one through nine. They're saying, no, I haven't had a problem. No, there's been no difficulties. However, towards the end in page two, um, they start to say, yes, um, there is a need, there is a problem, I do need treatment, then that's good. That's an indication that the officer may have actually broken through denial um, on the offender's part. And that's what we want to do. However, what I would suggest is if you've received no's throughout that uh, first part, to take the time to re-administer the tool. Because at that point, you have the offender, he's cooperative, and you're um, more likely to get a more reliable answer or response. OK, thanks, Grace. And Mike, um, from your perspective, any comments you'd make on the role play or any comments you'd make on your experiences of actually doing this in your district? Thanks. You know, well, what I'd like to add to that, that it's important that um, you help the individual deal with, the, the, be clear on the answers. Sometimes they may um, start minimizing at first, and you can go along, uh, go along, and then you start finding a little bit more honesty, part of what maybe Grace was talking about. Later in the, in the device, you can go back, and you can say, okay, let's talk about this area again. It sounds like you're saying something a little bit different. And so that, that was a valuable piece that we gained. And also, we found that it was in, important that um, we corroborated that information with other sources and explained that to them up front and compared that. So it's important to emphasize this is a place to screen them quickly and to, and to eliminate them as unnecessary referrals and to compare and contrast so that we have a, a good decision made based on several sources of information and not just the device by itself. Okay, thanks Mike. I'm going to turn this just to Dr. Knight for a minute for his comments on um, that whole role play and what was important from your perspective? Well, I think Mike and Grace did an excellent job showing how rapport can be established when an offender is being interviewed. Again, if the form is placed in front of the offender and told to hurry up and fill it out because we got other things to do, you shouldn't be surprised when the responses aren't consistent mm -hmm. with what you expect. So establishing rapport, again, is so critical, and as Mike showed, it can be accomplished, um, particularly with those experienced in interviewing the offenders. Um, for those who don't have the experience, I highly suggest some training and basic interview skills can go a long way in getting the types of responses that are consistent with the problems the offenders present. Uh, the other component is actually reading the item verbatim, followed by clarification without actually leading the offender toward a certain answer. Probing's good, but making them provide the answer you're looking for doesn't do you a service or the offender. Okay, thanks. And one follow-up with that, um, Grace was saying that if the, the questions on page one and page two were just really contradicting each other, or the answers, I should say, questions don't in, <laughs> contradict each other. The answer, if the answers are contradicting each other, she was saying readminister the test, don't just override what the score was. With any instrument, there should always be the option to override, but it should be a difficult process to go through. And in this case, where she did on the second page indicate uh, an openness to responses that weren't indicated on the first, 
it is good to go back and go ahead and re-administer the first page so that you can end up with a drug screen score that is consistent with the referral that you're going to be making. If in fact, uh, the, in the end, that doesn't occur, um, perhaps an override needs to occur, but I would suggest that at least one other correctional corrections person look at the form and look at the corroborating evidence to determine whether or not an override should occur. So overrides are necessary, but should be difficult to obtain. Okay, thank you. That's really important. Um, we have a number of faxes that have come in with some good questions, and I do want to get to them in a minute. But first, this is Mike Laughlin's favorite question, so I'm going to go to him with this. Mike, you did the um, screening instrument. You got at least three yeses from Grace. We know that. Um, that puts her into that DSM-4 category for uh, drug addiction or drug dependency, anyhow. Um, so now you've got the score of three or whatever you're coming up with, and now you know exactly what to do with Grace, right? Uh, no, not quite. <laughs> um, keep, please keep in mind that this is a tool by itself, standalone. It's, it's, it's of limited value. So you really want to corroborate this information with other, inform other sources, looking at reviewing the file material, uh, institutional records, treatment uh, records, uh, maybe even discussing the case with the um, defense or uh, U.S. attorney and some of their history back then, the pre-trial pre officer, uh, other sources, um, visits with the family during the pre-release can help you as well. And so you want to compare and contrast that along with the answer and not just assume. A high score, uh, by, in that, like Kate just described, does indicate a person needs to have some further step taken. But that may mean only an evaluation by a provider and then they may look at that and say, okay, at this point in time the person is doing well enough and does not need anything further. Uh, but at least you're looking at several sources and staffing the case with your specialist or your supervisor at the same time can help as well. Okay, thanks, Mike. And to Derek, other experiences um, from the National Expert Panel on how the interview is conducted or any other findings that the um, other members of the Expert Panel had that you'd like to add here? Yes, Kate. Um, well, the expert panel uh, actually pilot tested the TCU drug screen. Uh, they did, uh, they had options. In fact, they could actually uh, self-administer the uh, TCU by actually giving the, um, the instrument to the defendant or the offender and have them fill it out and then have them give it back to them. Or they could use it as part of their one-on-one uh, -on -one interview, as you just saw uh, Grace and Mike uh, demonstrate. And what we found out of the pilot was that the information was more solid when it was basically part of the one-on-one -on -one interview uh, because it, it lent itself for an additional uh, follow-up question, as you saw Mike did, or clarification. And it also kind of helps with that whole uh, process. One thing that we did find is that it was easy to use, and it took somewhere around 15, 20 minutes. I mean, that's the, the approximation. So it's just an additional tool that, that you put in your toolbox. It's not a standalone. You're still going to do pretty much the similar things that you've been doing, but it gives you not only good, solid uh, interviewing questions that get to the heart of the substance abuse issue uh, that the person may have, but it also gives you uh, uh, an instrument that you can basically have a uniformed way that you're kind of looking at the substance abuse cases and, and maybe even beyond the substance abuse cases. I also would like to, to add that at this stage, because it's not policy, we're encouraging people to use it at the pretrial services stage if you think that that's something that you could uh, benefit from. Also, you know, with pre-sentence investigations and obviously uh, for post-conviction cases that are, when you're making decisions or trying to make decisions as it, as it relates to uh, treatment services. So um, all in all, we have found that this particular <laughs> instrument is a good validated uh, instrument that should be helpful in your, in your district and for officers to use. Thanks, Derek. Let me just say that Derek just answered three different faxes with what he just said. So let me say that Jay Meyer from Minnesota, uh, Lou Harmon from the Western District of Virginia, and Karen Calhoun from Alabama Southern Pretrial all had pretty much those questions which went to the using the um, instrument at the pretrial, pre-sentence, and post-conviction stage was one preferable over the other or could it be used at all stages and I think from what Derek was just telling us it certainly can be used at any stage. I'm just going to ask Dr. Knight if he has any comments to make on that. 
now it obviously can be used at a variety of different points in the process. The key here though is the reference point is that 12 months prior to incarceration. So whether it's being used at pretrial or during probation, the reference period should be the same in both settings. But obviously the closer to that time at risk, the more likely you are going to be getting honest responses. So therefore the pretrial stage may actually be the preferred place of assessment or in this case screening. Okay, and a follow-up to that because we had one from Mark here in Georgia Northern and I'll find your name in a minute, um, but Mark had asked if somebody was actually incarcerated, you're talking about the 12 months prior to incarceration, but we now have people who've been incarcerated for 5, 10, 15, 20 on up years, so are we still talking about the 12 months prior to incarceration? Yes, although it may be a common misperception that drug use is rampant in the correctional system and it may occur occasionally. The reality is we're talking about the street time, the at-risk time prior to incarceration and although someone may have been incarcerated for 10 or 15 years, the reality is they generally have a pretty good idea or memory of their drug use patterns and that's really what we're getting at here are drug use patterns during that 12 months prior to incarceration. So ideally interviewing prior to incarceration is going to result in the best responses, but 12, 15, 20 years later, we still find that they can recall their drug use prior to being incarcerated. Okay, thanks, doctor. Um, and I'm sorry, that was Mark Davis from Georgia Northern, so I thank you for that, Mark. Um, Mark had another question that I'm going to take back to the panelists to um, Grace and Mike to answer on this. You've sort of touched on it, but I really want you to focus in on his question. The drug screen does not appear to address deception, defensiveness, or denial, certainly things that happen with um, a lot of our substance abusers. Our clients are not known for honesty and self-evaluation of chemical dependency, and how do we address this issue? So if you just go back and touch on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, Kate, the instrument does look at denial and the um, level of motivation that the individual may have. We talked about that a little earlier, and you can find that on page two in the last three questions. And the way these questions are structured, it actually determines what level of um, denial the <coughs> offender may be at or what level of uh, motivation he may be at in receiving treatment. So it is there and it's built into these questions. In addition to that, it's important to look at, as Mike has already shared, the collateral information that you're going to have when you're sitting down with the offender. So if it does appear that there's some denial, denial there, then you can simply take the time and make reference to what the pre-sentence report may say. And just letting the person know um, that there appears to be denial and you want to talk about that. Right. And I want to add to that also that it's important that you use other individuals involved in their case as well. So you may talk to a family member, you may talk to the attorney or the pretrial officer and get other sources of information there also. And I think just establishing yourself as an advocate, uh, even though I realize self-report answers, which is what this tool is made of, is, is a limiting factor, uh, using other sources of information and establishing yourself as an advocate, helping them to produce positive change and be successful can minimize the level of denial as well. Okay, thanks. And I think from what Mike and Grace are saying, this really does support the principles of Monograph 109 and 111 very solidly. So you're looking at the individual looking at that individual's risks and needs and tailoring your case plan to it and what this instrument does so beautifully is to really help support what conclusions you're coming up with. Um, let me go, uh, Derek I'm going to get this back to you because you've said it twice and I want you to say it yet one more time. Karen Calhoun from Alabama Southern also asked, is this a mandatory part of the supervision process or is it merely a recommended tool for substance abuse screening? So let me go back to you. Well, at this particular point in time, we are just now providing this drug screening instrument as information at this time. As I said, uh, we are going to submit this to the Criminal Law Committee in December to endorse this. So right now it is not mandatory. Um, the National Expert Panel has already pilot tested it 
uh, this particular instrument. So what we're trying to do is broaden pretty much the base of people to get a chance to use it at different stages. And as we basically pretty much put it out there, it'll help everyone with, with your particular decisions that you have to make as it relates to substance abuse. Um, one of the things that we have done just to kind of set the stage is that we have added at least two spaces in PAX ECM, the new 3.0 version. So that is, there is a place there, but we're not you know, requiring at this time, and we don't know uh, what the criminal law committee will, will do with regards to this. But at this point, we can honestly say that this has been an easy to use, validated, good, helpful instrument. And we want everyone now to kind of expand the use of this uh, instrument uh, just to see basically pretty much if it's helpful to them. And I'd like to, can I add to that also, maybe a little bit, and say that, that this is a, understand we're trying to eliminate unnecessary referrals. And so this helps you to eliminate a lot of referrals that went there before. And it's a quick screening instrument. It's got, a, it's guided. You've got questions that are guided, so you're going to get more accurate information from them. And just not assume, which many times we do that. We get a condition on the judgment, and we say, okay, off you go. And we rubber stamp them down the road. This gives us a tool in conjunction with other corroborative information to determine what the level of true need is and we may want to we may be able to eliminate referrals in that process and it can be used and tested out now even though it hasn't been formal policy yet and I, I would also just add in addition to eliminating uh, referrals you may also target those particular individuals that ne need services so uh, I think they're very solid questions a lot of times you may ask some of these questions but uh, chances are if you if you're doing an interview you're not going to have pretty much the time well not necessarily the time but you're not going to actually ask those 15 questions I know we were talking to Grace earlier and you mentioned a scenario when you were uh, administering this uh, drug screening instrument and tell us a little bit about where you may have had some initial feelings about what this particular person may have as far as a substance abuse issue and then as you went through the screening process you found out something totally different. Yes, as it was shared, um, we're seeing many of the, our offenders um, complete longer periods of incarceration and I was conducting an interview on an offender that had been incarcerated for six years so it was my natural feeling that well most likely there was not a need at that time uh, at the present time for drug treatment. However, I went ahead with the interview and he was very cooperative and what it showed was that um, he admitted throughout the interview that he had an extensive history of drug use. Um, he admitted that there was some use while he was away and most importantly towards the end he admitted a need for continued treatment. And I believe had I not used the TCU um, because of the validity of the questions and it helped me shape my interview, it really got to the core questions of um, talking to him about his addiction and probing and getting him to respond appropriately and helping me to make that appropriate referral for treatment. Thank you, Grace. Thanks. Okay. Um, I appreciate that because I think that is the perfect story of what happens on that day-to-day -day basis when you're just so involved in what you're doing and this instrument really gives you a chance to kind of step back and, and check your own assumptions. Um, we have another fax from Jeff Purcell in Northern Alabama and I'm going to give this to Dr. Knight. Most substance abuse screening tools like the SASE and MAST are designed for the general population. Is the TCU drug screen instrument a better tool since it was designed for the criminal justice offender and if so, how so? Well, I think we've spoken to the reliability and validity of the instrument previously in the one slide that compared it with the other instruments. And the bottom line is the TC drug screen was also developed for community application, but has been revised and tested for correctional settings. And fairly recently, we've been able to establish its use as reliable across race and ethnic lines, across gender breakouts, and across age, different age breakouts. Um, some of the other instruments that are commonly used do not hold up well in these different subgroups. So obviously we feel like at this point we have the evidence to back its application in the correctional, various correctional settings. Okay, I'm going to stay with you just for a minute. Um, we've talked about this screen, we've talked about using it, and we know it's up on our website, but that's not really where they should go for it, right? Tell us a little bit about where people should go for more information. Yes, for more information, the best place I would recommend you go is to our website at the IBR. And the website address, as you've seen across the bottom of the screen before, is 
www.ibr.tcu.edu. In addition to the drug screen form, you'll find another, a number of other assessments and instruments that can be downloaded for free use, a number of brief interventions that you may be interested in, as well as a number of research summaries of the different projects we've been involved with. Um, I encourage you to go there and make use of it. I would encourage you to do the same. I've been up on that website and it really is, it's easy to navigate through. It's got a lot of great information and a lot of really good links. So that's the IBR website um, for all of you out there in the field who are going to be using this and all the managers. I'm going to turn this over to Derek so he can tell you how to get more support and whether what other information is going to be available from ops on this project. Yes, on the JNET, uh, the OPPS website, we have the uh, TCU drug screen on, under the substance abuse uh, treatment services uh, section. You can uh, get information with regards to that there. Also, uh, under the <coughs> National Expert Panel, we have information there also. Um, the other thing that I would ask you to do, in addition to uh, Mike Laughlin from the Fifth Circuit and, and Grace Saunders from the District of Columbia Circuit, um, uh, get in touch with your representative. Um, we have uh, a list of those particular people on the JNET. We want you to kind of contact them. They're just as intimately involved in this process as we all are. They've been very uh, invaluable in helping this process to, to get to where it is. So um, it's on the JNET OPPS website and also under the uh, National Expert Panel. Okay, thanks, Derek. Let me go back to Grace and to Mike and to ask you for some closing comments. So, uh, Mike, let me go to you first, I think. Okay. Thanks, Kate. Let me just close in my end in saying that our pilot test of this device found that it's a good, brief, accurate tool to measure and target our resources to those that are in the greatest need. Uh, we also found that it was important to corroborate that information against other sources and to establish ourselves as an advocate in that process. Um, we feel like it's important that you work toward understanding that this is a risk. We're measuring level of risk. A lot of people ask, okay, what do we do now? What do we do with them? We got this score. Understand it doesn't tell you where to go with them. Okay, this score means this. That's your professional judgment, which we emphasize. And um, so you need to look at all the sources, including the score on the TCU, to make that decision and to um, recognize that we're, we're, the whole purpose here is to be an advocate for positive change, establish, establishing objective, uh, objectives that are outcome driven. And so that would be all I would add. I'd like to add, um, we found we had the same findings that Michael had, but just to add, um, as a result of our using the TCU in, in the District of Columbia, and to stay, uh, or to parallel that, which has um, come out in a new monograph 109, we've developed a memorandum of understanding with the halfway houses in D.C. We want to have an early intervention <laughs> into the offender's case planning and, and case work. And a big part of that is going to be our using the TCU. So we're excited about that, and it's going to help the offender. Um, it's going to help us help the offender in determining, determining what type of treatment he's going to need. Okay, thanks to all of you. I can't believe it. Our hour is up. I'd like to thank Dr. Knight, Derek Goddard, Mike, and Grace for joining us on the set. Go to their websites, get more information. Thank you all for spending your time with us today, and have a good one. Bye-bye.